everyone, it's Possum. This is uh, for Mother Matron, the extended cut. Let's, um, let's play it, shall we? Don't watch it if you're easily disturbed. Or a child. Thank you. It's graphic. The Mother Matron loves you and considers your health incredibly important. The pessimist's credo, or one of them, is that non-existence never hurt anyone, and existence hurts everyone. So, by Thomas Ligotti, The Conspiracy Against the Human Race. Hmm. My consciousness swirls in an inky black river of nothing. It feels familiar. I've been here before. Every time I'm here, I always think it's going to last forever. And yet... Wakefulness. Somehow my consciousness stirs. Where am I? I feel so strange. Deeply numb and lost. Almost... I rack my brain, trying to make sense of things. Questions that should have obvious answers, none come to me. Questions such as, where am I? Who am I? What has happened to me? What do I know? I know I exist. I know I breathe. I know this room is disgustingly warm despite its cold, cold walls. I know that a horrible wet sound is driving me mad. I know red blood flows through my veins. I know my heart pumps that blood beat by beat. I know the inside of my stomach bubbles and burns with acid. I know my bladder feels like it's about to burst, filled with urine. I know my intestines pipe through over a meter of contracting meat tubes coiled in my belly. But not much else. I don't remember what distinguishes me from any other sack of meat. I wreck my brain. I reach back as far as my mental arm can reach, underneath the old shelf full of baggage that writhes unpleasantly and glares at me, despite having no eyes that I can perceive. The weight of the shelf was crushing my arm. The act of recalling is in itself painful. It would be easier to just leave it all there. In the dark, where it might be forgotten forever. Just like most of the people that were sent down there into those hopeless tunnels. To the place I lost myself and everything. But no, I won't forget. I have to remember, or no one else will. I reach back further. The weight of a sharp corner starts to scrape layers of skin as I reach further in. Finally! My mental hand clasps around something. A small and soft object that compresses under my fingers. I pull my arm out from under the shelf. The sharp corners gouge my arm open. A crimson river runs rapid and splashes onto the floor. Except how... My arms never moved. I I'm not even bleeding. I felt it though. I felt my skin shredding. I heard the sound. I could even still feel the object between my fingertips. What am I holding? Why, it was just what I was looking for. It's a memory. It's small and hovers like faint smoke in the air. But it's a start. A pathway to more. Yes, I'm starting to remember now. Lizzie, that's it. That's my name. My name is Lizzie. It's nice to meet you. It's only a start of the breadcrumb trail, though. I have to follow it. It's easier to live through a memory when you can share it with someone. You'll listen, won't you? You'll help me retrace my steps. Good, good. Oh, but where to begin? Where should the dark fade? Where should I... Wake up! Huh? Finally! 
Jeez. You were out cold, Liz. I, uh, what? I was covered in sweat, my eyes darting around like flies to figure out my surroundings. I was in the hangover of a deep dream that clung to me like glue. In front of me was a blurry shape of a person. A boy? Young man? Male, at least. He's staring at me with concern and frustration. Where am I? Who are you? He frowns at me. You really were out there to the world, huh? You're at the workshop, Lizzie. In Pack Rat, where you work. And I'm technically your boss, though I like to think we're all on the same team here. My name is Fred. Starting to ring any bells yet? Oh, right, right. And, uh, what do I do? <laughs> Looking at him now, Fred gives me the impression of a chubby bear. His face almost has a snout. His nose twitches back and forth when he's not talking. Maybe it's dust irritating his nostrils. He pinches the bridge of his nose and closes his eyes. Please tell me you're kidding. I suppose even with no memory, it's not hard. It's not that hard to deduce. There's sewing machines throughout the room, and I'm seated at one. Clearly, I sew. I think I may even have sewn the sweater I'm wearing. I must be good at it too. It's soft and comfy. Then again, I can see little scars speckled on my fingers. Were they scars of experience or scars of clumsiness? Let's say it was the former. I let out a little chuckle and smile. Yeah, I am. Had you going there, huh? In truth, I was only half kidding, but I assumed, hoped, I'd start remembering the other parts once I woke up more. Fred didn't find the joke quite as funny. You people sometimes. Tell you what, Lizzie. You're clearly running low on steam. I really shouldn't do this. But you need the rest. The Mother Matron won't appreciate your slacking. Perhaps you can make it up in the coming weeks. Go home, get some sleep. Maybe stop by Spruce's clinic too. Get a checkup. You have two days off, max. Okay, okay, I'll go home. Except, where was home? Wake up, me! I sat there for a moment trying to remember where to go. Lizzie! Go! Uh, yes, sir. Wearily, I stumble out of the workshop. I feel exhausted to my bones, aches and throbbing pain deeply seated in my flesh. There is a dreamlike haze resting on the world around me. It feels unfamiliar. Clearly, this is a place I should know. This is apparently where I work. And yet, I have no idea where I am. I rack my brain and I pat my pockets, hoping to find a clue. Fortunately for me, there is one. A small notebook. I open it and thumb through. Bits and pieces are starting to come back to me as my eyes scan the scattered diary entries, notes and doodles. I finally find the most helpful page. Stay away from the friend sheet. Right, right, I remember better now. Okay. The boss was correct. I was in pack rat right now. Named so because of how densely filled the area is. Every building here is some kind of workshop or storage zone. Some places here are packed so full that you can barely walk around them, though fortunately the place I worked was roomier. More broadly speaking, I'm in the boarding, the town, city, I call home. A secluded place enclosed in makeshift walls made from whatever was available. Scrap metal, old furniture, repurposed rubble. Outside the walls was an endless miasma of fog that obscures things. No one's really seen what's out there, and anyone that's attempted to explore the mists has never returned. If I had to describe this place, I guess I'd say it's like a half-empty glass filled with dirty water. The glass is fragile too. Does that make any sense? Well, it does to me anyways. More important than metaphors though, I know where home is now, and I could feel it deep in my bones that I needed to sleep. Though the detail on the map leaves something to be desired. 
thanks past me. I'll figure it out. My memory is just hazy from being so tired. And so I pick a direction and start walking. The winding streets don't make much sense to me, but I follow them all the same. I am alone, but muffled voices keep me company. Sometimes muffled sobs too. I try not to focus much on them. I think I used to in the past, but my heart couldn't take it. Nothing I could do, even if I want to, anyways. Everyone's got to do something for the collective. Everyone's got their jobs, as I have mine. Whatever the mother matron needs of us. My shoes are old and worn, only offering a meek defence against the hard asphalt streets. They fit well though, and the ground is dry today. They get the job done. They're like everyone here in lots of ways. Doesn't matter how weathered you are, the fact you're still together means something in you is strong enough to keep you together. May your spirit grow like the calluses on working hands, or on the soles of your feet, so the mother matron says. In other words, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. You grow through adversity, and by the end of everything, you're the best person you can be. Gives all the hard parts of your life a kind of silver lining, or at least that's what I take from it. Squeak! <laughs> huh? My thoughts are interrupted by a lump beneath my shoe and the panicked yelp of a small rodent. I lift my foot and the thing scurries back under the grate beneath my feet. There below the street is a tunnel full of thousands and thousands of rats scurrying for dear life through endless canals. I doubt the poor things even know where they're going. The one I stepped on somehow managed to climb its way up out of the grating, only for my clumsiness to scare it back where it came. I kind of felt awful inside for that. Throughout the boarding, is a network of tunnels designed to funnel the endless swarms of rats underneath our feet. No one knows where the little critters all came from, but they flow like water beneath the streets. Thousands upon thousands of rats, compacted against each other, covered in filth and God knows what else, waste matter clumped in their fur. Our primary source of protein. Some kids have to fish for rats, sorting through ones that are too sick and diseased to eat, and ones healthy enough for consumption. The yield is never particularly high, and the rats never particularly taste good, unless you know how to prepare them. The one I stepped on had to have been rather spry, the poor thing. I could only hope maybe its unintentional intervention gave it more time before some kid impaled it on a stick and roasted it. Blah, I don't want to think about this anymore. I decide to keep walking to Spruce's clinic. Uh, hello, Spruce, you here? Yes, yes, I'll be right there. Stitching someone up back here. Please, take a seat. I sit down on a stiff chair with minimal padding. It makes my tailbone ache, but I'll endure it. Spruce is known as the resident healer of the boarding. She taught herself by reading pharma pharmacological and medical books she found in the library, as well as through experimentation. This isn't to say there aren't others that try their hand at medicine, but to put it simply, none of them are as good as Spruce. If she can't fix you up, you're out of luck. She walks in the room. Ah, Lizzie. Been a while. Those are some dark bags under your eyes. Working long hours? Not sleeping lately? Guess not, eh? Uh, I passed out at work today. Fred told me I should see you. She rolls her eyes and gives a fake laugh. <laughs> ah, of course he would. You have to be sick. It can't be his fault at all, right? <laughs> Jerkwad. Let's give you a checkup anyways. Follow me to the exam room. A small joke as the exam room is just across from where I'm sitting. She gestures for me to sit on one of the beds, and after doing so she does her usual routine. Checks my blood pressure, pulse, shines a light down my ears, nose and mouth. Lightly strikes a mallet on my knee. I look around the room, noticing that it's gone under some renovation since I last visited. I'm amazed you find the time to decorate the place. It's looking good. Ah, oh, thanks. I squeeze in a little here and there. Usually when I have to watch someone close while they sleep. That's a creepy way of putting it. Oh, you know what I mean. Folks in recovery. At least a few people that experience seizures. 
stuff like that. Anyways, I'm proud of how it's looking. Genuinely can't believe I found that poster in such nice condition. I'm happy with how the phoenix has turned out too. I look towards the bony fellow at the east side of the room. What about him? Is that a real skeleton? Spruce checks my heartbeat and my lungs using a stethoscope. No, it's plastic. A patient that scavs on junk a lot gave it to me as a thank you. Trust me, if I wanted to get a real skeleton, I wouldn't have to look very hard. Really wish I had a skull, though. She nods and puts down the stethoscope. Everything seems good from what I can see. But that's just what I can see. Tell me how you're doing. Anything odd lately? Odd sensations, pain, nausea, shortness of breath, stuff like that? I'm a little sore, but I think that's just from overworking. Maybe bad posture and being tired. I've also been seeing things. Hmm? What kind of things? Sometimes, sometimes I'll be standing there and the world suddenly shifts. Like, right before my eyes it turns into something horrible. Horrible sounds. Flesh growing where it shouldn't be. Things that aren't really there. My heart starts beating really fast and I freeze, terrified. And just like that, the world's back to normal and I'm panicking over nothing. My dreams are really strange too. Mm hmm. You don't believe me, do you? She shakes her head. Wasn't what she meant. I actually do believe you. Just thinking. Wish I could say this is the first time I've heard something like that, but... But... Well, some of the mumblers I'm taking care of now said stuff like that. Before they turned. Really? Yeah. Can I trust you to keep a secret? I'm only telling you because I think it's important you know. Uh, sure. Contrary to what people think, the crepuscule isn't the only place where mumblers are made. Not anymore, at least. You're kidding. Not in the slightest. Granted, people have broken down before around the boarding. You know that. Lots of our neighbor brothers and sisters struggle with feelings of anxiety and depression. But this is different. Mumblerism, or whatever you want to call it, is a much more rare and severe thing. It's like a complete detachment from reality. People stuck in a looping nightmare that never ends. And all they can do about it is ramble. That's Mother Help Us, and it's happening around here now? Why haven't I heard about this? As I said, it's really rare. I only have a few cases out of all the people I treat. And if the AC gang's been dealing with any, they sure aren't sharing. I'm trying to keep it under wraps, as I haven't gotten to study enough people to get a grasp of the emerging symptoms or causes. And I don't want people to panic. Mumblers already don't get the best treatment by most people. Imagine how people would be if they jumped to the conclusion that they're contagious. Ah, I can see what you mean. To be clear, I don't want you to jump to the conclusion that that's happening to you. You might simply be having sleep deprivation induced hallucinations. Or maybe some gas from junks is making the air a little funny. Hell, maybe this shit y She stops herself for my sake. I mean, shipyard. It's just more rank than usual. I thought it important to warn you, though. For now, I'll give you some medicine that should help with the anxiety. Stop back for regular checkups and we can keep an eye on it. See how it develops. What's going to be in it? It's a mixture of lavender, valerian, lemon balm, St. John's wort, and some other stuff that makes it taste good. My latest and so far most effective concoction. Or so my patients tell me. Thanks, Bruce. Anything else worrying you today? No, I think that's it. Fred gave me some days off to go to sleep. So I'll go do that once I leave. All right, that's good. I don't see anything else abnormal with you, so I think we're done. Oh, I'll give you some tea that you can drink that can help you fall asleep if you have trouble, just in case. While I go get stuff together for you, can you run that bucket of food over there to the shack out back? The mumbler shack? Yeah. 
It's about lunchtime, and they need to eat. Would you mind? No, not at all. <laughs> Great, thanks. There's keys hanging up by the door. I grab the bucket, which is full of some carefully assembled sandwiches, wrapped in paper and bottles of water. The exit through the back door, which leads to a small yard with a small, roughly shed-sized building, maybe slightly larger than that. I've never liked coming back here, as ashamed as I am to say. It's always good to help the mumblers, but... I mean, I can hear... I can kind of hear them from here. <laughs> it's very unsettling. Just endless word salad. If you try to pass what they're saying, you get these horrible vignettes of misery that you wish you could unhear. They can't help it, though. And I shouldn't feel threatened, even if I find it uncomfortable. Mumblers are harmless. I repeat that to myself as I unlock the shack door and enter. Inside a somewhat cramped but generally well-kept bunk room. Some bodies are sleeping, others are sitting upright on the bed or standing near the corners. None of them notice me, they're lost in their own nightmare loops. Gosh, poor things. I really wish I knew how to help them. These people deserve better. Most of them were hand-selected by the mother matron to brave the horrors of the crepuscule. Crepuscule. <laughs> a labyrinth of darkness that lies beneath our home, full of terrors that are kept at bay by a locked tunnel. No one really knows why the mother matron sends people down there, or what they end up finding, but you can see the effect it has, at least on the ones that made it back home alive. I shudder to consider what could have happened to the poor souls that didn't return. I can only hope that they've passed on peacefully, and whatever ended them was swift and painless. I ponder almost if that end would be preferable to what the mumblers go through now. They're alive, but can you call this living? And these ones here in Spruce's care are the lucky ones. Many don't get the help they need. Some are hurt, bullied, killed, at least once. People call them wastes of space, drains on our ever-dwindling resources, mouths to feed that can't contribute anything meaningful, or so people say. But they're people. They didn't choose this to be so broken. They need help. They need love. I would want people to take care of me if I ended up like this. I don't know. Maybe that line of thinking will lead us to starve to death someday. Would my morality hold up when my body is dying from weeks of no food? Can I eat the concept of doing the right thing? I would like to think, though, that it's preferable to die because of the good things you did rather than to survive because you gave up your humanity and compassion. At least right now I feel like that's a choice I would make. Anyways, I've been kind of standing here holding a bucket of sandwiches and water for a while while I was lost in my thought. My arm is shouting at me to give it a break. I dropped the bucket in the middle of the room. Do they like come get the sandwiches and water themselves? Does Spruce feed it to them later? Hmm. A question I will seek an answer to another day. I leave, gently closing the door behind me. I get my medicine from Spruce on the way out of the shed and head home. Feeling my body already starting to power down, I walk through the door of the house, ready to throw myself on the mattress before something catches my eye and freezes me in my step. Resting on top of my bed was a paper envelope with a red wax seal emblazoned with the matron's symbol. My heart sank to the bottom of a deep, dark canyon inside me and bile began to bubble and churn violently in my stomach. I reached to pick up the envelope, hold it, hoping that this was an illusion, a trick of the light. It wasn't. It was real. As real as can be. The letters with the red wax seal are a legend amongst kids in the boarding. They say that it's the worst, most horrible piece of paper you could ever own in your entire life. I undid the seal and removed the letter inside. I unfolded it. My eyes darted back and forth, scanning the page. It read as follows. My dear child, the very thought of you warms oh, me so. My dear child. The very thought of you warms me so. Oh, you've got such a lovely voice, Mother Matron. 
Seeing you and your siblings grow through the years is always my special delight. I give so much of myself every day to ensure you all remain safe and secure inside these walls. Alas, I cannot do everything on my own. Every so often, I must rely on my children's support to do what must be done for the collective good, even if it means sending my darlings into the jaws of danger. This letter is to inform you that you have been personally selected to become a surveyor. This is a title of great honor, bestowed upon those that will brave the depths of the crepuscule for your mother matron's pride, as well as the continued survival of the boarding. You will be paired with two boys named Pucks and Rich. As soon as you receive this letter, you are to meet with them, make preparations for your journey below, and visit me at my dwelling in Mother's Tower. Attempts to shirk your duty will be met with severe punishment. I will see you soon, my dear, with all the love in the world, your Mother Matron. I stare at the letter. My legs begin to wobble. My hands start tremor. The letter floats to the ground, like the way they describe leaves in books. I start breathing fast and hard. My entire body quakes. My eyes roll to the back of my skull as I pass out and collapse to the floor. Um, back here. Did I die? Was that everything? Was that the end of my memories? Kind of abrupt, to be honest. Did you ever hear the story about the girl in the sweater? No. Of course not. It's still being written. A year it gets downright crazy. I'm so excited. What the? What is this thing? What am I? What are you? What is anything? This creature can hear my thoughts? Everything and everything were nothing once. Then they became children. I think things would have been better if they stayed as nothing. The disease called existing is widespread and cancerous. Extremely virulent. It infected everything that was nothing and forced it to deal with the pain of being. Forcing things that exist to be happier than they exist. Manipulative. Terrible. Oh, but enough about things. Pardon my language, but what the fuck is this thing talking about? And why does it kind of look like me? Ignoring my confusion, the creature steps around me and outside of my vision. It fiddles with something behind me. The slurping sounds grow faster. This world fades again. I'm awake again, deeply confused, but awake. I sit there on the ground, frozen for a while before reality hits me again. I stare at the painting on my wall. The mother matron, out of every person here that could have ever been selected, she ends up picking me. My mind is back to where the mumblers in Spruce's clinic. Them and the endless droning madness that's consumed everything about them. Entire people with dreams and personalities erased by trauma. Why? Why me? I think back to how I was supposed to work in a few days. How was I supposed to visit Spruce again to make sure I was better? To keep living longer? No matter what I wanted to do, the decision was made for me. Mother needed me. I was not the kind of person that wanted to find out what happened when mother's disappointed. But where to begin? After some thinking, I decided a good place to start would be by asking my neighbour sisters. They're a pair of twins named Janine and Katie. I'd like to think we were pretty good friends, and I was glad to have them as my neighbours. I approached their front stoop. Katie was reading from a book with a faded cover, while her sister painted her nails with jet black nail polish. Hey Katie! Hey Janine! Hey Lizzie! Hey Lizzie. You seem chipper. I thought you'd be more gloomy. What do you mean? 
Oh, well, I... I saw the poster come by and drop something off at your place. They don't come by that often. Surprise, the male boy doesn't want to visit the shit zone. Oh, I didn't explain that, did I? Well, you saw on the map that my home is in a place called the Shipyard, right? It's, uh, it's not actually called that. See, it's actually named after the fact that this area is where the majority of the sewage and waste is discarded. I'm sure you can guess what the actual name is knowing that. Cursing makes me feel bad though, so I call it the Shipyard instead. You absolutely cannot evade the smell here. It's awful. Sticks to everything like a film. I've gotten mostly nose blind to it at this point, fortunately. Though sometimes I still have to break out the perfume. Is it one of those letters? Yeah. Red seal. Oh no. No! Ouch. Hope you don't die or lose your mind. Janine! What? Just being real. It was nice knowing you. Don't be so insensitive! It's okay. I'm still processing things, but I'm holding it together. I still have things to do before... before I go. Anything we can help with? Well... Should I ask them anything? You guys can have my stuff when I leave. See, dibs on the bed. Janine! Lighten up, I'm kidding. Kind of. Let's be real though. Would dying really be the worst thing that could happen to you? Oh my god, what is with you today? Oh, like you and I haven't had this exact conversation before. Everyone else wants to make happy. Like the toilet bowl they live in doesn't stink of shit. Doesn't everything about this place make you feel like closing your eyes forever sometimes? Janine, what are you even saying? That we'd all be better off dead? Uh, kinda? Not like I'm rushing to the noose or anything, but I feel like it would be a relief. It seems like a really sad way to look at life. Life can be hard, but there's always bright spots worth seeing. People to love, happy moments that stay with you forever. Katie doesn't see it, but Janine gives a, a I don't want to say it, but a jerking off motion while rolling her eyes. I can't say she doesn't have a point, though. I mean, I know where things are heading. Maybe it's better I make peace with it. Don't talk like that, Lizzie. You're going to come back. I know you will. Katie, you know that no one has... It doesn't matter! You'll be the first! You'll make it back in one piece. Even if you don't believe it, I do! They believe in you, Lizzie. Katie... Uh, for what it's worth, if anyone was to ever make it back, I think it would be someone like you. Still got dibs on the bed, though. Um, do you know anything about the Crips, Creeper School? Sorry, I don't think I know much more than you, I'm afraid. Yeah, the books never really went into what's down there. The Mother Matron never really talks about it other than how dangerous it is. And there's not any first-hand accounts of it to go off of. The most anyone seems to know is that it's like an endless series of tunnels with dangerous creatures inside. Some people say the Krepsicule is constantly shifting and morphing, almost as if it's alive. But that's just a rumor. Again, no first-hand accounts. No, I have everything All I right. need. Uh, thank you guys for your help. I should get going. There's a lump in my throat. I swallow and talk through it. It, it was really nice knowing you guys. Suddenly, Katie embraces me tightly. After a moment, she looks at me with twinkling, moist eyes. Lizzie, you better come back. I'll never forgive you if you don't. She holds me for a moment longer, burying her face in my chest. Before she can stain it with tears, she pulls back. I can't think of the right words to say, so I simply smile at her and say thank you. 
Janine simply gives me a gentle wave. It's subtle, but I know that's something she really does for people. Take care, Lizzie. We'll be rooting for you. The atmosphere was chaotic as people rushed in and out to buy food and other supplies with their allowance. I felt my senses bombarded by the endless chatter and the myriad of smells, many of which were quite unpleasant, and I lived near a sewer. Through the cloud I slipped to what I hoped was the west side of the market. I tried to keep my eyes above the crowd to find that mysterious Meaty Marissa character. I found her quickly, or rather, I heard her. Fresh meat! Fresh meat! Come and get your fresh meat! Come one, come all! Tired of rathead cheese? Absolutely sick of fly patties? Come try the most unique cuts of meat you can find in the boarding. Flavor beyond comprehension. Then she finds me, her eyes locking on me like a hawk. You there, the beautiful lady with the sweater. Come, come, try Meanie Marissa's signature cuts, name pen. Against my better judgment, I step towards the stand. I'm pretty sure I found her, but I ask anyway for confirmation. Uh, so you're meeting Marissa? I've been looking for you. I, I don't remember having to oh, look for her, I but... see my reputation precedes me. Another eager customer looking for the most scrumptious, sumptuous, munchous meat. You won't be disappointed. Ugh. Before I say anything, the strange girl dangles a big fat slab of meat in front of my face. Feast your eyes before you feast. Literally. Once you get a glimpse of my cuffs, you won't stop drooling. Uh, don't worry, I provide for your napkins. A strange slab of fresh flesh in front of me has a kind of marbling and grayness to it that's downright repulsive to the core. My stomach immediately twists itself in knots. Uh, what kind of meat is that? I told you! It's the tastiest and most unique meat in the market. Doesn't explain anything. No, I mean, like, where's it from? For my supply, of, of course. <laughs> you think I resell other people's cuts? Ha! The nerve. No, what I mean is, that doesn't look like rat meat or any other kind of meat I've seen. Come to think of it, it looks strange. She puts a finger to her lips and lets out a shh. Shh! Trade secrets for investors only. You know what isn't a secret, though? How delicious it is! Read the reviews. She thrusts a long piece of paper in front of my face. Apparently it's full of real reviews by her customers, written by hand in a messy script. Unique. Tastes like nothing else. Not the worst I've had. I could describe it as edible. A journey into Flavortown. I must taste. Eat it right now, if you can. Ah. She withdraws the review scroll. Come on, it's only 30 drac. Savor the flavor. Doesn't it look succulent? Mouth-watering? Doesn't it get that stomach grumbling? Mm, she sure is insistent. I ask myself morbidly, should I buy it? From here on, you may encounter situations where you have limited amount of time to make choices. To survive, you will need to act fast and think carefully. The penalty for running out of time will vary depending on the situation. In some instances you may be inconsequential, but others possibly not. Sometimes it may result in instant death. In other instances, Lizzie will have to rely on her gut and she might make choices you don't want. Be wise, alert and cautious. Good luck. Don't forget to save your game often. Should I buy it? Absolutely not. No. I slap myself in the face mentally. What the hell was wrong with me? No, no way. I decided to move on and just get what I came there for. No, I'm good, thanks. Oh, come on! Don't be a window shopper. Don't you know that's rude? Come on, I'll even let you try a bite before you buy. The enthusiastic girl chops a small morsel off the slam and sticks it on a fork, extending it towards me. Try it? Ah, I seriously don't want it. No, no way. Listen, I just need some information. I really need to find someone. The girl's expression turns sour. Some nerve you've got. You're not even a customer, and you expect me to help you. Please, I really need your help. I'd rather not tell her, but I don't see any other way forward. I lean in close to afford myself a measure of privacy. I was selected to be a surveyor. I need to find who I was paired with. Really now? What, and you can't just meet them at her tower? They would have got the same note too. To be honest, I, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> 
The way the Mother Matron worded it, though, we have to meet after finding each other. I don't know how literal she wants me to take it. Also, what if I end up being there by myself and she sends me down into the depths all alone? I don't really want to risk it. Please, I really need your help. I'll pay you. The girl strokes her chin. Okay, fine. Stop giving me those sad baby rat eyes. I'll help if I can, but no promises, okay? 18 drac up front. Thank you. Here, here, take your money. I'm looking for two boys. One named Pucks, the other is named Rich. Don't know a lot about Pucks. Rich, though. You're in luck. Rich is a friend of mine. Well, an acquaintance, I guess. <laughs> I don't know how he feels about me. I don't want to make assumptions. <laughs> I like him, though. He's such a soft guy. I can see her eyelashes flutter wistfully as she thinks about him. Suddenly she remembers that she's actively being watched by another human being. Uh, no, I didn't mean like like that. Like a friendly like. Understand? Uh, anyways, he lives in one of those bunk houses near the west edge of Florgot. Careful, though. The ACs have been swarming around there lately. That's odd. The bunk houses are right near the border between Forgot and Nobi. Aren't they encroaching on Spruce's territory? Some major shit went down there apparently near the friend's shed. Before you get too excited. No, the beast in the shed didn't prove itself real. The friend's shed is a kind of local legend. They say there was a lonely kid that used to hang out near a shed in Nobai, which was the original location for the market district before the Three's Company moved everything. The shed was locked up tight and no one ever had been inside of it. And yet this lonely kid one day heard a voice coming from it someone alive, stuck in there, and just wanted to have a friend to talk to. The lonely kid spent all of his time there at the friend shed, playing and laughing and talking with a friend all day long. He'd get picked on for what appeared to others as him just talking to himself. Any attempt he made to prove that there was a voice in the shed ended in failure, with the voice remaining silent when anyone else was around. The kid didn't need to be believed though, he had the friend he wanted. But then, apparently the shed got unlocked. The kid went inside and was never heard from again. It's worth noting that if the shed did unlock, it was locked very soon after, as it's still boarded up tight. I'm sure the kid was real. Urban legends have usually a small nugget of truth in them somewhere. However, I think what really happened to him was that a troop of the AC gang might have simply killed him while trying to rob him. They hid the body and since the kid didn't have many friends, no one looked. No one tried to find where he was buried. And so his fate instead became part of the tapestry of a legend. Kind of sad in a way. Some dudes got killed up there, though. They were an isolated patrol hanging around up there and they got killed. I don't know who was responsible, but they suspect the killer is hiding out in Forgod. The Spruce gave him special permission to do searches in limited areas, starting with there. Spruce is the unofficial mayor of Forgot, and she's backed up by a peacekeeping institution that calls themselves the Four Leaf Clovers. Given the AC's violent tendencies and selling of drugs, they don't get along. So, for her to allow them to look around in full gut is really abnormal. Something terrible must have happened if she's willing to give them inches. Personally, I think it might be a ploy they made up so they could slightly expand their reach. But that's just my intuition. Surprise! I didn't hear about any of this until now. AC's gotta project an aura of being in control if they want people to take them seriously. It makes them look bad if they can't handle some punks slicing their boys apart deep in their own backyard. They're trying to keep it under wraps until they get the guy. I see. Anyways, back to Rich. Can you tell me where he lives? Oh, right. Got a map? I can show you where it is. I hand her my hand-drawn map. She furrows her brow a little bit at it, but regardless marks the spot with an X. As for Pucks, as I said, I don't know much about him. I think he lives in Junks. But good luck finding him. Place is big and he mostly keeps to himself, it seems. I don't know what kind of brain damage you'd have to have to live there, though. Hmm, maybe that's mean. Something generally might have fallen on his head over there. I probably shouldn't say things like that. I understand what you mean, though. Odd to want to live in a place where garbage and drunk junk falls from the sky. Not that I have much room to talk, I guess. Because you live in the shityard, right? I feel sorry for your nose. Honestly, surprised you don't smell worse. <laughs> I have a smell? What? You didn't have to say all that. Anyways, I think I have what I need for now. Thank you so much for your help, Marissa. No problem. It's a 
slog of a journey to Forgot, and following the vague directions the map provides certainly does not make it any better. I sh really should make a more detailed map sometime. Why was this place called Forgot anyway? I really wish I remembered. Oh, oh. That was why. See, it's a funny story actually. The story goes that the name comes from a kerfuffle that happened forever ago, back when the originals were laying the foundations of the boarding. By that I don't mean the buildings and stuff. They were found where they are. Wasn't really fit for life though, so the originals were tasked with making it livable. Eventually, once things were settled, the originals began sectioning off the boarding into districts, being named by whoever was appointed to run that particular district. Forgot, before it was named Forgot, was established by Saren Butcher Hodgkins, who was best friends with Junk's founder, Possum Brady. Neither were people of good reputations. The two went on a celebratory romp with some jugs of potato rum and their homemade chemical concoction, a drug that would eventually go on to be called canned heat. Anyways, as you might have heard earlier, stuff falls from the sky in junks. Well, at the time, that had not happened yet. There was garbage there, but no one had ever seen it fall from the sky. Can you see where this is going? A porcelain pug dog, about half the size of a person, fell right on Butcher's head when he was taking a massive huff of canned heat, exploding on impact in a mass of shards. Miraculously, Butcher survived, but with permanent memory loss, and so when it came to officiate the naming of the district, they asked him what he would, what he would like to call it. I forgot, I don't really care. And so, one of his subordinates got a little creative with the styling, and the name Forgot was born. Bonus fact, canned heat went on to become an extremely popular substance. Some blamed Butcher's survival on the drug's supposed side effects of near invincibility. The AC gang apparently had a cornerstone on that market and charge a premium for it, though people have made up their own cheaper concoctions in an attempt to approximate it. I don't recommend trying it, especially the home brew kind. Stuff can melt your nose clean off, and moreover, it does not make you invincible. It just makes you numb to pain, or at least that's Spruce's conclusion on the matter. Sorry, sometimes I have too much fun talking about stuff I've learned. The boarding isn't a nice place to live exactly, but it has character to it. It's history, especially. I shouldn't waste so much time exposing it, though. I'd be in a lot of trouble if I ran into an AC gang patrol. Careful to not make too much noise. I close the door behind me. No interest in being hassled by the ACs. I just want to find Rich and get out of here. Ideally, I should try not to spend too long in one place. I haven't run into anyone, anyone yet, but, you yeah, know, who knows? What, what could be hiding here in this building? It's, it's a weird building. Hopefully, just Rich. The walls were scuffed and filthy with peeling paint that flakes off like petals on a dying flower. A musty smell of mould, and mother knows how many years of dust it's been clinging for dear life, waiting for the living to send it flying. Less graffiti than I had expected, though. People with creative bones usually get a lot of inspiration from terrible places, it seems like. Well now, there's something. The entrance hallway terminates in this odd junction between rooms, a small set of stairs leading to darkness. The matron's seal has been painted on the wall above in splatters of red paint. I really do not like this place. Something about it makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand at attention. I feel like a rat in a starving cat's house. Nothing to be done though. I have to keep moving before terror paralyzes me. Immediately I begin to regret not having thought to bring my lantern. Already at a fork in the road, with each path obscured in shadow. Which way should I go? Go left? Go straight towards the... Go left. I find myself trudging down a very dark hallway, only faintly lit by a light at the end of the hall. I walk slowly and carefully, trying to avoid any obstacles obscured by darkness, with my hands crawling the wall like spiders for guidance. The texture is rough between my fingertips, oddly comforting. As I make my way towards the light at the end, my hands reach into nothingness, which nearly causes me to panic and fall. I couldn't see it at first, but there was a path hiding to the right waiting in ambush. Nothing there I can see except more shadow. Soft darkness waiting for me to wade its waters if I go down that direction anyways. Which way should I go? Go towards the light. The lit room at the end of the hallway is a dead end. A surprisingly large room with nothing in it. It's probably some kind of storage room. I'm surprised no one made it their home though. People kill each other in Bicktown over rooms a quarter of the size. Huh, there's a hole in... There was a hole in the wall here, apparently. 
Did it used to lead somewhere? Doesn't matter now, I guess. I should go back the other way. Down the side hall. Nothing for me this direction. I think that, but then something catches my eye. Huh. One of those heartbeat listening things. Odd place for this one of these to be, though. Maybe Spruce might want it. I should take it with me. Reaching my hands towards it. Something in the air. An ugly buzz that hovers just above the quiet. A tremor in the air around my hand. Before I can pull back, I've already picked it up. Huh? A sterile room. It sits in a nexus for the Lost and Destitute. A woman sits there, a bundle of nerves. Her eyes scan the room. The walls are barren, save for that strange symbol that the nexus for the Lost and Destitute had a fixation for. The cabinets to the other side of the room must be full of that beep they inject into you when you overdose. An undo button of sorts, she thinks to herself. The girl ponders how much money must have been spent in vain attempts to prolong the lives of people like herself. People so hopelessly stuck in their own brains or in the cruel chemistry, chemistry of their own bodies that they cannot help but pursue self-destruction. People who carelessly treat their lives just as disposable as a tissue. People willing to burn every bridge, turn over every stone, leverage every asset, all for just one more time. Hospitals and medicine, as far as Loretta was concerned, were for people far more deserving People that will actually get better. People that actually want to get better. Not filth like her. Part of her wishes her mother had just given up on her. For her own good. Then it would be way easier for Loretta to kill herself in peace. With a cosmic high so strong it could pulverise her soul into shards of glass. And fry her brain like an omelette. And her useless selfish little heart could finally rest. That kind of death or even better. A world where she simply never existed. These kinds of thoughts were medicinal to Loretta. When things were at her worst, she simply could retreat into a reality where she simply never was, and those that she hurt would live unsullied, beautiful lives where every goal was achieved, goals impeded by Loretta's existence. And who knows, maybe she found a place where no one could find her. She could turn this world into that reality yet, with one beautiful explosion of euphoric chemicals that would make rock stars blush. Then her thoughts interrupted. A door opens. The doctor walks in. His face stiff, lips pressed in a small, tight frown. He's rehearsed in a mirror, but performance anxiety still grips him. So, what's wrong with me, Doc? Sheena's been saying it's just withdrawal, but this doesn't feel like it. I'm worried it's something worse. I'm not sure how to tell you this, Loretta, but you're pregnant. She looks at the doctor, struck with consternation. What? You're pregnant. We'll have to do an ultrasound to figure out how long you've been pregnant for, but pregnant all the same. How... how is this possible? How could I not know? It's rare, but still more common than you might realize. It's called a cryptic pregnancy. The woman's brain explodes in panicked pulses of memory. Dingy rooms, memories of pills, burning nostrils, Enough to kill a racehorse, a friend remarks, amazed you're still breathing. There's, there's no way. There's absolutely no way. Would you like me to show you the blood test results? More memories assault her mind. I don't care if it kills me. It's one less shitty person in the world. It's the only thing that helps anymore. Leave me alone. I'll do whatever you want. I need it, please. It's my life to ruin, not yours. Fuck you and your tests. You're lying to me. You're fucking with me. Loretta, I'm really sorry you had to find out like this. But it's the truth. You're going to have a baby. The doctor's face is stone. He's as serious as he can be. I... There's no fucking way. Do you need a moment to yourself? <sighs> Sounds like it. Yeah. Yes, please. The doctor goes to leave. He stops, looks back, back at the woman for a moment... Then he leaves, closing the door behind him. The woman is alone. She feels more alone than she ever has before. She feels like a brick, drowning slowly. Wow. I think I've gone insane. Or I'm on the cusp of it, but lovely. Do I even want to try to make sense of what I just saw? Mm. 
later, and a place that's less creepy than this, preferably. I go back and head down the side hall I walked past before. The side hall into darkness eventually leads me to an edge that's lit by a small window with a single doorway. Glimpsing out the window, I think I'm on the second or third floor. It's hard to tell for sure. Wasn't I just underground or something? I didn't even go up any stairs. This building doesn't make a lot of sense to me. More artwork too. These drawings seem to mostly be done with chalk or very thin paint. Some of it seems to grow, glow faintly in the dark. This is come to the river, pick yourself a body bag. A message too. Ah, come to the river, pick yourself a body bag. Ah, just read that. What? I really shouldn't stick around for long, but for some reason I feel like I want to examine this room closer. Hmm. What should I do? Examine the room. I can't help it. I have to look around. Something's calling me. I look around carefully, shuffling around pieces of broken glass, torn carpet, a sort of trash left behind. Signs of life long moved on. Now that I'm paying more attention, there's an odour in here. It's faint, but what glimpses of it my nostril ha have are repulsive. Hmm. More him. Bigger him. What? What the beep is this? I mean, beep, 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 beep. I nearly jump out of my own skin at the sight of this desiccated skeleton of something, a rat maybe? Oh, who knows how long that's been there. Next to it is a note scrawl on dirty cardboard in a manic hand. I'm too curious. I spent this long searching on nothing but a hunch. Maybe there's, maybe the note's what I'm looking for. I hadn't eaten in a week. My stomach hurt a lot. I found a dead rat, probably scurried away from the butcher, clawed at these walls till it died hungry, itchy, scratchy. No one else found it in the dark except for flies and me. The flies ate and ate and ate and beeped and ate and laid eggs all inside its guts. Dead and rotting, its eyes melted out of its head. Lots of eggs, yummy eggs, dotting its skin like grains of rice. I ate it. My tummy stopped hurting. I felt alive again. But now my stomach is going buzzy, buzzy. Buzzy, 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 is that, is that the mother matron symbol? What's that doing here? Huh? Reaching my hand towards it, something in the air, an ugly buzz that hovers just above the quiet, a tremor in the air around my hand. Before I can pull back, I've already picked up the paper. Huh? A hallway. It sits in a nexus for the lost and destitute, a shelter for the broken and vulnerable that can't let go. In that same hallway, on a wooden chair, sits a woman. She has dark, messy hair, a t-shirt bearing artwork commemorating the tour of a long-forgotten band from decades ago. The radio stopped whispering their tunes, but in her mind, their full volume on repeat. Background noise to a party that she wishes never stopped. Good times, long ago. Long gone, sorry. She looks to a pamphlet she was handed during the orientation. Not even worth the paper it's printed on, she thinks to herself. She throws a pamphlet into the trash can down the hall with a faux basketball toss and sighs. She has not noticed, but a younger girl with blonde hair and a sweater has taken the seat next to her. She sits there idly for a moment, expecting the dark-haired woman to acknowledge her. However, the woman with the dark hair is lost in space, at least two minutes into a song about someone in the corner in a spotlight losing their religion. The world around her might as well not even have existed. Unfettered, the girl with the blonde hair and the sweater speaks. So, what are you here for? <sighs> the girl is unflappable. That's okay. You don't have to tell me. A pause, then. Meth. Huh? That's when I'm here to kick. Wasn't my idea, but... My folks got worried about me. What? Expecting someone more ghoulish? No, it's not that. I'm just teasing you. She was oddly plucky, and she did not immediately seem to exhibit the signs of long-term myth abuse. Compared to friends, the dark-haired girl 
had in the past that were on it, she kept herself together rather well. Maybe it was that sickeningly positive attitude. Though, now that the cat was out of the bag, there was a slight gauntness to her cheeks, a tiredness to her eyes. Suddenly the subtle details became more obvious. The woman with the dark hair is pensive. The armour on her tongue suddenly cracks as a blonde girl looks at her warmly. Oxy. My mom dropped me off here. Ah, uh, I see. That's rough. A cousin of mine died from that stuff. The plucky girl nods in understanding. She flashes a bright smile at the girl with the dark hair. Uh, what's your name? The girl waits a moment, thoughtful. Then... Loretta. I'm Sheena. Nice to meet you. Hmm. What in the world? Where was that? When was that? Why? Why did I see that? Am I losing it? Hmm. I should get moving. This place is getting to me. Gotta get rich and get out of here. Through the dark I find a winding stair, well, looming into a void. Oh dear. After following a winding staircase which has a strange absence of landings, I finally reach its bottom. The acid in my legs is burning brilliantly after all those stairs, though I am thankful they were downward. Ahead is a small room, fortunately brightly lit from the outside. Ah, this place seems a little better. The warmth of the light coming in the window is comforting. From what I can see here, there's a bathroom to my left and a door at the end of the hall. What should I do? Go to the bathroom. Ugh, this place is filthy. Look at all that grime and dirt. Who used this place last? A thousand pigs? Two thousand? How big were the pigs anyway? <laughs> Could they fit in this room? I've never seen one. Read about them before. I hear they can be very stinky. They sound cute though. Well, they definitely are. Some books I read even had illustrations that look kind of sweet. I kind of wish I could hug one. I smile at the thought before a twinkle on the ground catches my eye. Mm, what's that? Reaching my hand towards it, something in the air, an ugly buzz that hovers just above the quiet, a tremor in the air around my hand. Before I can pull back, I've already picked up the object. It's a ripped off fingernail. Huh? It's a dark tiled room. The door is locked. The room has not been cleaned in days. It sits in the darkest corner of the nexus for the lost and destitute. The girl has been trapped inside this room for just as long, though the mess is not hers. It's the mess of countless others that were here before her. Her clothes are old and in tatters, not hers handed down, uncomfortable and filthy, hardly fit for any human being. The girl holds a torn off nail in the palm of her hand, her index finger burning with pain. The girl has been pounding a fist against the locked door and the tiled wall next to it for hours. Blood is dripping and splashing at her toes. Her nails are chipped and bleeding from scratching at the walls like a furious cat. One was torn off completely. Fuck off with the self-help bullshit! None of it helps! I can't even feel anything anymore! It's all just... It feels like static. Just noise! All the time! You don't fucking get it! It's not like you really care about me anyways. Let me out! Let me out! Let me out! I need to get gas so fucking bad, man! I can't take this anymore! Hours pass. How many? She doesn't know. Too many. Please! Let me out of here! It'll hurt. It'll hurt. Why is it so cold here? Are you trying to freeze me to death? Is that what you want, you freaks? Hours passed. How many? She doesn't know. Too many. I just want to go home. Her body hurts all over. Her stomach has felt like a cauldron for what seems like an eternity. She can almost imagine little holes forming in her stomach lining as she as it cannibalizes itself. Cannibalizing itself. Maybe that's the trick. Maybe that's what was required of Sheena. How hard could it be? She always heard that the force it takes to bite through a finger is little more than biting through a carrot. Her fingers are bony and thin, but look at the flesh on the finger where the nail fell off. Look how red glistens on the nail bed, like cherry sauce on a sundae. Maybe it's delicious, like heaven and life all at once, right on your tongue. Just as she begins to open her mouth, the door swings open, as if it was that easy the whole time. A man stands there, his eyes are filled with dark determination. It's somehow more frightening than death to Sheena. 
I can get what you need, but you're going to have to help me with something first. Take this and come with me. He hands the girl an old rusted kitchen knife and begins walking. She stares at it for a moment, stunned and whimpering. Then she follows. Huh? Holy sh sheesh. That was scary. Something about that was so vivid and real. I'm out of breath. My fingers hurt too. I should get moving. There's got to be something better through that other door. At the very least, I do not want to be here anymore. You know, call me crazy if you want, but I have a good feeling about this door. Oh, mother, I really am going crazy. Oh, mother. Get it together, Lizzie. Get it together. I knock on the door gently. Hello? Is anyone yeah, here? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, God. I shrieked and stumbled backwards. Where the hell, I mean, heck, did you come from? Sorry, I was sleeping. But like, like where? You popped out of nowhere. Uh, over there. He gestured to a small cramped looking hole in the northern wall. Oh, is there a bed there or something? No. So you don't sleep in a bed, just a little hole in the wall? Yes. He fidgets a little. I had one for a while, but a couple of those AC gang guys came by and took it. Not that I minded. They needed a place to sleep. I'm happy to help. Ground's just fine for me, huh? Ha ha ha. Ha. Did they threaten you? I'm fine. Oh, that's good. They just kept punching me over and over until I gave it to them. They didn't bother threatening me. This poor kid. I don't recommend taking the chair, by the way. It makes your tailbone hurt after a few minutes. Also, the one leg just likes to come off sometimes. But you can slap it back on. What? The table is good, though. I really like to keep that, but if it stops you from punching me, I don't mind giving it to you. Please leave the blanket there, though. I, I don't like eating off the floor. And last week, the neighbor brothers lost their frisbee, so I had to give them my plate. Ugh. I'm not here to take your stuff. <laughs> You're not? That's a relief. That's got to be the guy, right? What are you here for, then? I explained how I got the letter from Mother Matron and needing to find the boy she mentioned in the letter. Oh, I got one of those letters, too. Glad you found me. I wasn't really sure what I was going to do about that. I thought about just heading out to Mother Matron's tower, but he nervously tries to peer behind me. I, uh, they were still around earlier. You didn't run into any of the ACs, did you? No, no, I don't. I didn't. I, I think it's safe to leave. I pondered telling him about some of the other things I saw on the way here, but he'd probably think I was insane. You're rich, right? My name is Rich, but I don't have any money or anything. Uh, again. Again. Uh, not here to take things from you. I literally just told you I came here because of the letter. Alright, sorry, force of habit. Nice to meet you, uh, the pucks, I'm guessing. No, no, my name is Lizzie. Weird, you look like a pucks. This is strange. I'm not sure how to take that, but, um, okay. Guessing that means you don't know who he is or where he is. Nope, not at all. Why does he sound so proud when he says that? Great. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. We just have to go look for him then. How about we head to the market? I kind of worked up an appetite trying to find you. That sounds great. Let's go to the market. Rich leads the way out through the building. It's along the way that something unnerves me. Despite just coming back the way I came, I did not enter the same room. I was back at that one hallway from before the junction with the symbol painted on the wall. I freeze. A cold sweat breaks out on my forehead. Am I, am I, am I sick? Hmm. Hey Lizzie, what you doing? Something wrong? Hmm. No, nothing. I'm coming. Just got a little lost is all. I trot along, trying to shake the anxiety off me like cobwebs still lingers below the surface. At the market we both realised that our stomachs were empty so I decided to buy us lunch. We made our way to the market and approached my favourite food stand which sat far away from Meaty Marissa's booth of mystery meat and sold skewers. Oddly I could almost swear I still felt her gaze. Oh she's over there, she's keeping her distance but I can see her watching from behind a barrel. She's laser focused on Rich and has not noticed that I have noticed her. 
Oh well, I think she's harmless. She's leaving us alone for now at least. I think she just wants to ogle her crush. I certainly will be better equipped to deal with anything that might happen on a full stomach at the least. The delightful smell of grilled rat and vegetables makes its way up my nose and tickles the parts of my brain that cause my mouth to salivate. I could never resist the succulent chunks of chewy meat that ooze delicious greasy oil. Rich and I both order a large rat skewer. Thank you so much, I know I'll pay you back. Don't know how I'll pay you back. Uh, one day I will. But if it takes too long, keep just keep your punches to my body and not my face. I have a real bad toothache as it is. Jesus, kid. You don't know me anything. It's a great get-to-know-you present. Some extra allowance anyway. That was a complete lie. The allowance part, I mean. But I wanted to be nice anyway. Besides, you knew if I'd even lived to use whatever allowance I had after this ordeal was done. Who knew? I looked to Rich. He was eating as if he hadn't eaten in weeks. Perhaps he hadn't. So, um, you're absolutely sure you don't know anyone named Pucks? Nope, not at all. I'm extremely positive. Why does he still sound so proud when he says that? Hmm, so we still don't have any leads. Who else could we ask? Hmm. What is it, Rich? Do you hear something? No. Ah, drone! Strange flying thing nearly crashed right into Rich's head, but fortunately stopped short. Looking closer at it, it seems like it's made of metal and plastic. What the heck is this thing? Birdie. A birdie! It's a birdie! Rich, it's not a bird, look at it! Flies? Of course it's a bird. Suddenly had a headache. The little flying machine made a weird chirping noise and rotated slightly back and forth. It almost looked as if it was beckoning us, albeit crudely. Look, the bird wants to show us something. Rich, this isn't a bird! Wait for me, tweet, 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 birdie! Lizzie, it's not listening to me, I'm gonna go catch it. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute! And just like that, the machine and Rich take off. Hey, wait for me! Strange metal flying machine weaves its way through the air of junks with a boat like grace, listing to and fro through the gusts of wind. Rich continues to chase and shout wildly with reckless abandon, not even considering that at any moment a 10 ton metal dumpster full of garbage and scrap could land right on his very head. No one has an explanation for it, but the district of junks officially established by Possum Brady, who almost felt more at home amongst piles of trash and filth, had a dangerous characteristic. Unpredictably, things fall from the sky here, from a source that no one has been able to determine, like rain, but pulpier, and sometimes deadlier. Sometimes you're lucky, and the only thing that lands on you is some mouldy fruit, maybe some bags of animal feces. Other times you would get the shell of a car landing on your head, or shards of glass. One time I saw a bowling ball. I mentioned the porcelain pug of legend earlier. This isn't to say there isn't a reason to come to junks, or rather, that people don't find a reason. If you're persistent and know what to look for, no one can find things, or one can find things of extraordinary value, or things that can be polished to value. Components for machines, clothes, sometimes preserved food, cans, plastic wrapped. I found some comic book here too once. It was about a young man that had a violent alien being possess his hand, and the two had to learn to coexist. The world seemed a lot nicer than mine, to be honest. I stopped following Rich for a moment. Why am I pursuing this with such drive? My chances of survival are close to numb. If the legends are to be believed, a horror of unspeakable character, or one so unspeakable as to render all who encounter it speechless, awaits me. If I stood here long enough, I could simply wait for oblivion to find me. End the whole ordeal right here. Just, just close my eyes and breathe, and a life will have come and gone in a flash. You'll make it back in one piece, even if I don't if you even if you don't believe it, I do. I believe in you, Lizzie what it's worth if anyone was ever asked to make it back I would think it would be someone like you I must rely on my children's support to do what must be done for the collective good what was I doing I can't lose myself I have to keep strong there's more important things at stake I'm scared beyond belief but just lying down to die isn't how I want to go I have friends that believe in me I have to help the collective whatever that ends up meaning it's clearly important. I look up. Rich is far away, but I can still see him. 
If I start sprinting now, I think I can still catch up. I slap my cheeks, scan the sky for any garbage rain, and take off after him. And then I fall on my face. Ow! Huh? But it's a paper cup. Nothing really unusual about that. Especially not here. And yet, I'm drawn to it for some reason. Why is that? I want to look at it, though I can't really tell you why. Can't give you a reason I should either. Rich is running away, and I could lose him. Uh, keep the cup. Leave the cup. <laughs> it's a waste of time. It's just trash. Why would I want to look at it? Plus, look at it. It's filthy. Yeah, no, not touching it. I keep running and follow after Rich. After a long and exhausting chase, I finally catch up to Rich and the machine. This building looked remarkably better than the other structure and drunks, junks, which were usually absolutely wrecked. It was kind of eerie, and I couldn't help but wonder how this one building stayed sturdy. Wow, we went pretty far. It's a lot of fun, Birdie. The little machine makes another beep then proceeds to fly away to the top of the building. It disappears inside one of the open windows on top. Ah, oh, Bertie's gone. I groan. I gave up correcting him at that point. I was too out of breath to care. Uh, um, I wanted to... I think I wanted us to go inside, maybe? I think so too. Let's go. Appearances can be deceiving. For as relatively nice as the building looked on the outside, the inside more resembled the trash heap aesthetic I expected. While the building was clearly intact structurally, there was all kinds of garbage, scrap metal, and tools strewn everywhere. If you'd told me at the time that a tornado had just torn through the building, I'd have believed you. What a mess! What is this place? It's my house. But a tall boy with a grumpy face and a black metal helmet wanders in holding the strange flying machine from earlier. Birdie! Oh my gosh, is that Birdie you're holding? What did you do to Birdie? What the hell are you... He means the little machine you have in your hand. Uh, oh, oh, you mean the drone. Mm. It ain't a bird, moron. Birdie! It's not, but it flies. Have you, like, never seen a picture of a bird? Or do you have holes in your brain? Oh, it's, so it's not a bird. Guess you're right now that I look at it closer. Lizzie, why didn't you tell me? I did tell you, damn, I mean, I mean, darn it. Uh, don't have time for this shit. You said your name was Lizzie, right? That means the kid with the detuned radio for a brain is rich, I assume. Yep, correct. You wouldn't happen to be Pucks, would you? Yes! Fucking finally. I'm looking all over for you two. But you were just standing around in your house. What do you think the drone was for? It's got a camera. I was using it to look for you. Ah, oh, that's really cool. Where did you get it? Made it myself. You would be amazed what cool shit you can find around junks if you know where to look. Machine parts and electrical components lying beneath the garbage. Just waiting to be put to use. There's a glint in his eyes as he talks about it. This kind of thing really... Makes him happy, I think. He must really love building things. Sometimes people look down on those that spend all their time in junks, let alone a guy who lives here. How has his house not gotten crushed yet? But I kind of admire it. It takes a lot of resourcefulness to be able to wade through the garbage and scrap and find stuff that's useful or make something new out of it. Well, it's amazing. So is that the camera on the front? He nods proudly while tapping the bulbous camera orb. Whoa. How are you able to see the pictures, though? Ah, it has a UHF transmitter on the rear of the chassis. It can beam a signal back to the antenna on my portable TV. I have to be careful, though. If I block the line of sight between them, the signal doesn't come through. He talks excitedly and fast. It's a little hard to follow all the details. He seems really happy to talk about it, though. Well, I didn't understand much of that at all. I think he's saying the drone sends the pictures to his TV so long as they can see each other. Oh, I see. So using that, he was looking for us. How did you know what we'd look like, though? We're all strangers. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I didn't. Oh, so he... Was he even actually looking for us then when the drone found us? 
Oh, so you just found us by accident? Yeah. So really, he just wanted us to think he was using his drone for something productive, when he probably was just playing with it. You were just having fun flying it, weren't you? For a moment, he looks like he's about to explode. <laughs> uh, anyways, we have to get going, don't we? Gotta do what Mother says, right? Even if it's sending us to a fucking grave. I'll be back in five minutes. Just gotta grab my box of tools and shit. We should probably get going. <laughs> yeah, we should. Together we make our way to the Mother Matron's monolith. The monolith sat tall, looming over us as if we were pitiable pit little slugs, ready to get squished under its boot. The sky always looked different here, looked wrong somehow. The normal and ever-present set of pillowy clouds congealed into this fluid jelly that seemed to want to slither inside the tower through every small crack and opening and swallow everything inside. It never would though, it simply maintained a comfortable distance from the tower out of fear. A fear that was starting to make its way into me as I gazed upon the monolith. Doesn't matter how many times I see it, it still floors me how huge this thing is. Wow, I've seen this bef close to it before. It's so big. Yeah, it's big alright, says Pucks. Pucks stormed past us and went inside, hands in his pockets. Rich and I followed Pucks inside, brows furrowed and somewhat offended. The lobby was a bit underwhelming compared to the rest of the building. It was also considerably more damp than I thought the Mother Matron would like it. For some reason I thought someone would be meeting us here. Apparently there's no welcoming committee. There's an intercom though. Uh, what? Over there, says Pucks. He gestured to a small strange box on the wall with two dimly lit red lights on it. It's an intercom, something you can use to talk to someone who's in a different part of the building. Ah, oh, I see. You're really smart, huh? Uh, how does it work? Well, I've never used one. Just read about them in some old books I found. I think you're supposed to press that button and talk into it. Oh, I see. With none of us wanting to actually press the button, we stood there until awkwardness decided to rest itself on the moment. So, you're going to press it or what? Huh, I didn't realise I was supposed to. Well, of course you are. You wanted to see how it works. Best way to do that is to use it. Grrr. I hesitantly pressed a finger on the button. What do I say? My voice cracked from the nerves. I don't know, I guess, hi, we're the three the mother matron summoned. Oh. Oh, we all jumped a mile in our shoes. Beep, 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 beep. I guess it heard you, pucks. Shut up. Pucks, was that really called for? I don't really care. Let's move. we got to hit the 12th floor. Pucks stormed off again. Rich's eyes were glued to the floor. He looked like a sad little mouse, and I felt my heart twinge for him. He's kind of a jerk, isn't he? No, he's not so bad. I think he's just scared like me. He just shows that differently. Rich. Let's get going. Yeah, you're right. After an exhausting climb up quakey stairs, we find ourselves on the 12th floor. The landing leads us to a narrow hallway, the walls of which lay flat and uncomfortably angular and sharp, extremely artificial looking. It felt as if the hallway was made out of sharp knives resting against each other, waiting for the right moment to slice us to ribbons. The hall terminates in an aged doorway made of wood and fogged glass. Behind it, theoretically, was the dear mother matron, waiting to greet us and embrace her dear children. I'd finally get to meet the paragon of kindness that I knew was the caretaker of every girl and boy I knew. And yet, every synapse in my body was a fire, screaming at me to turn and run. I kept my feet firm, 
but were my skin sent sentient, it would have ripped itself off my flesh and jumped out the closest window it could find. Guess this is it. That's weird. Are you sure this place is so? I don't know. Something about it bothers me. Uh, I'm as positive as I can be. Well, it's nice of you to volunteer to go first, Pux. You're such a great guy. God damn it. I didn't say anything about that, you bleep bleep. You're kind of a jerk. Stop yelling, I'll go first. It's not what she said, but <laughs> I volunteered so confidently just to get them to shut up. But the instant I said it, I felt intense regret. I was totally going to do it anyway, but fine if you insist. Thanks, Lizzie. And so I stepped closer. I reached my hand to open the door. I knocked. Hello, we're here, Mother Matron. We're up. Well, we're coming in. I clasped the doorknob. I twisted it, only to find it locked. Huh? <coughs> Silence filled the hall. Uh, are you Mother Matron? Huh? Hello, anyone there? Silence filled the hall yet again. Then a crackling static buzz leaks in from the ceiling above us. I looked up to see a speaker above us. A warm and tender voice laced with static drips through the perforated disc in the ceiling. Yes, my darlings. Your mother matron is here. You are all ready to do what I ask of you, yes? We're here, aren't we? Get on with it. I'll elect to ignore your impudent tone, Puck. For now. Wait, aren't you going to come see us? No, my children. I am unable to leave this chamber. I have kept this a secret so as to prevent panic, but your mother needs it. Very sick. <coughs> a raspy cough erupts through the speakers, hissing and peeking. Alas, I must Yeah, doesn't even have the courtesy to come see us off before she sends us to be butchered. Pax! Do you have something to say, Punxsutawney? Punxsutawney? Nope, nope. Just just wondering when you're going to get to the point. Because of my illness, I am unable to carry out the grand mission of the Collective. Which is what you have been called here for, my children. Grand mission? What's the grand mission? We seek the womb of paradise, my beloved. It is no secret that life in the boarding is difficult. I have tried my hardest to make it as wonderful as possible for you all, but there's only so much that can be done. I dream of a future where we can leave the boarding and travel to a place of peace and love and kindness. That is what the womb of paradise is, Nibir. It is your real home, where you all belong, and it lies in the depths of the Christmas. So that's what the surveyors are meant to do, search for the womb of the paradise in the Crepsicle. Yes, the honorable surveyors are to carry on the mission of seeking the womb of Yeah, yeah, search for the MacGuffin in the creepy dark tunnel. We get it. How will we know what it looks like? And what are we supposed to do once we find it? You are fortunate that I have patience for such impudence. You will know it when you find it. It is a paradise beyond measure, possibly resplendent and exciting. A place where all your troubles will melt away like ice. Once you find it, should you succeed in doing so, you are to return to the boarding so that you may guide your siblings on the great journey. Am I understood? Any questions? 
Um, I have one, Mummy. Why haven't we heard about this grand mission before? The Womb of Paradise sounds wonderful. I wish I could have started looking for it earlier. I would have been right by your side the whole time searching, if possible. Rich, my dear boy. The Womb of Paradise lies in the dangerous depths below. You are only going there because it has become necessary. If I'm not in a state of unwellness, I'd make the journey myself. I do not want to compel my children to delve into the darkness unless I have to. I see. That's so considerate of you, Mummy. Pucks groans loudly. Um, I have a question too, says Lizzie. Is, is there anything you can do to help us succeed? Anything you can give us? Some advice, maybe? Near the shaft leading to the crepuscule is a locker room filled with various items. You are free to take anything from there that might be of use. As far as advice, all I can offer is to never give up hope. Keep seeking paradise. I have a question too, Mother. The word Mother leaves his lips like a loogie. It's like he hates the word in his mouth. Why would you pick us out of all the kids you could have picked? Why us specifically? Suddenly coughing erupts again, more intense than before. Oh, I must rest now, my dear. <laughs> oh, please hurry. I do not know how much longer I have left for this world. I must bring you to paradise before I depart this mortal coil. Be vigilant. I love you. Hmm? Silence. I guess that's the end of the conversation. Pucks glared towards the mother matron's receding shadow. I tapped him on the shoulder gently. I guess she left. He continued to glare for a moment, but finally turned away. Let's go already. Pucks made his way to the stairs. Rich and I exchanged looks, then followed suit. Wordlessly, we went down the long set of stairs to the first floor. It was less tiring going down than going up, fortunately. The locker room itself sat in a hall to the side of the stairs, positioned towards the back of the monolith's structure. The lockers themselves were in terrible condition. Most of the doors had either fallen off or were seemingly kicked in. We were all still shaken from the conversation with the mother matron, but we tried our best to not let our fear manifest itself. Rich was the first to speak. Yes, smells horrible! No kidding, let's get our stuff and go. Carefully avoiding puddles and scummy tiles, Puck stepped past Rich to the lockers. He began rooting through them. What do you see? Nothing mind-blowing, but something's better than nothing in this situation, I suppose. Here. Pucks tossed the crowbar towards Rich. The crowbar nearly bonked him on the head and knocked him out, but he fortunately caught it with a yelp. Ah, careful. You caught it, didn't you? Pucks rummaged through some more. Yeah, this could work. Here, Lizzie, take this, says Pucks. Ooh, Pucks fortunately had me a large knife. It was a lot heavier than it looked. Careful, it's not the sharpest thing, but you could still cut yourself pretty easily with it. I carefully ran my right hand against the side of the blade. Its rusty surface, surface felt scratchy against my fingertips. I'll be careful with it. What are you taking? Pucks pulled out a large wooden baseball bat. He took a few slow practice swings with it, getting comfortable with its weight. I'm taking the slugger. You're really cool! It suits you! Hmm, do you play baseball? I used to. had a couple of friends used to play with, but... Never mind. That's not important. It was brief, but I saw his eyes briefly fill with sadness. I felt bad for asking, but I had the feeling apologising would just hurt him more. Um, are there any tools in those lockers for something? I, I feel I not need those. I have some in my toolbox, but let me take a look. Doesn't hurt to have more to work with. Pucks rummaged around some more, then shouted in excitement. 
Ha ha, toolbox, let's see what's inside. Uh, seems well stocked, it's not bad. Some of the tools are kind of old and rusty, but they'll get the job done. Adding new beauties to my collection. Alright, I think this is everything we need, or at least everything we're gonna have. Are you two ready? Yes, I suppose so, says Rich. I say me too, as ready as I'll ever be. Pucks nodded and led us on. Through the shower room was a room that was largely empty. Save for one old hatch. I think this is it. I swallowed hard. I could hear the light chattering of teeth behind me, probably coming from Rich. I looked at them, nodded, then went down the hatch. We now stood in a long dark tunnel which extended far ahead into pure darkness. The tunnel felt unnaturally cold, both to the skin and to the soul. The very air carried the message this was a place that held nothing but abject misery. Even if you were blind to the decrepit appearance of the tunnel, the cold would tell you this was a place where happiness had never been. We could, use, we could see our breath in the tunnel, white mist punctuating each exhalation. Bro, you wouldn't happen to have another sweater, would you, Lizzie? No, um, it's not really helping me as much as you'd think it would. <laughs> Sorry about that. Still bet it feels warmer than what we're wearing. Hope it's less, less cold further in, but um, that's probably futile. Uh, shall we get going? Let's go. Pucks and Rich nodded. We descended further into the tunnel, trying not to pay mind to the fact that our chances of becoming back were slim to none. The craggy tunnels were illuminated by lonely light bulbs, which miraculously had not burned out. Who knows how long they had been burning down there, down here. This must be some kind of mine. Really? What makes you say that? I've read some books about them and the pictures in them look a hell of a lot like this place does. I bet you 20 drac that we'll find, the mi find mining equipment somewhere ahead. I thought back to my market purchases early today. Well, unfortunately for you, I'm broke. What a shame. I'll take an IOU then. <laughs> Gave a little laugh at that. It was nice to see that Pucks had a lighter side to her. Hey guys, look at this. This is Rich. What, what, what was it? What is it? I think it's a journal or something. Oh. Resting on a wooden bench against the wall was a small little book with a black leather with leather or maybe faux leather cover. Let me take a look at it. Do we really have time for this? I'll take any excuse to not go further in. Thank you very much. I thumbed through the journal. Many pages were water damaged and illegible, but I eventually found a section that was somewhat readable. I read aloud. I love how it feels inside of me. I love the feeling of it crawling around inside my guts. The razors on its fingers scrape the walls and it hurts and bleeds. But I feel beautiful. The feeling of a life inside, feeding on my insides. Everything about me keeps it alive. I will protect it with my life even if it hurts. I will kill if I have to kill. I will pillage if I have to pillage. When I, when I will rest as dust to be blown off the top of an old shelf, scattering into the air as grain. Remembered not for how I stood, but for the thing that grew inside me. I cannot wait for it to hatch and crawl out from between my legs. It's kicking. The rest of the entry was illegible and the writing stopped shortly after this point. Hmm. What did any of that mean? It sounded like it was written by someone with a few screws loose. I wouldn't read that deep into it. What? I don't know. We looked around frantically. <laughs> we couldn't see anything. <laughs> what the? <laughs> I saw something my mind could scarcely comprehend. A horrible lumbering tower of meat with glassy blue eyes that stared with a cold hunger and malice. 
Oh god, it writhed in the distance, a living nightmare that was delighted to know that none of us could wake up to escape it. While it was hard to determine exactly where its attention was drawn, it was clear that Rich was in its sights. That's when it reared up and charged at Rich! If I didn't do something, that monstrosity would do something terrible to him. What do I weigh? What do I do? If I wanted to save Rich, there was only one option. There was no way he could react in time and get away. He wouldn't even know he was getting killed until after that creature gored him. Watch out! So I charged towards Rich and shoved him out of the way. What? I shoved Rich to the wall. He was safely away now while I stood in his place. Before I could get too comfortable, I heard the stomping feet of the beast. It was coming right at me! I had to think fast. Oh! <laughs> really fast! <laughs> Pain! It got me. Couldn't even read the things. Man! An eruption of fire in my chest that flared down the whole width of my torso. I wasn't able to act fast enough and the beast was more than happy to take advantage of my slowness. I... Uh, okay. My inside sizzled and gurgled as the creature's spittle began to reduce me to a pulpy slop. I collapsed. Puck screamed my name, as did Rich. I didn't hear it, though. I was already gone. The Cryptocule had claimed another. Dead end. That was actually fun. <laughs> that was really fast. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> That was very good though, that was fun. Yeah. Thanks for watching everybody, hope you enjoyed it. And um yeah, we'll see you later.